It's always good to smile. That's one of those songs that I remember growing up singing in the church. And I always thought to myself, what in the world does it mean to have peace like a river? What is Isaiah writing about when he says it twice in Isaiah? The idea of what God's providing for the righteous. Peace like a river. Love like an ocean. And joy like a fountain. Doesn't the world need those three things today? I know it's one of those things, as Jed and I discussed doing that song, we're like, well, we may or may not have a job at the end of today's service. I don't know why. I don't know why we, we become that way, that we can no longer express who we are as Christians, even if it allows our children to remember those things, that God supplies love like an ocean, so vast and so wide. Joy like a fountain that never stops to flow. And peace like a river that never stops flowing. Some of those three things got me through some hard times in my life. And I remember singing that song growing up. What does it mean to have peace? You know, a couple weeks ago we talked about joy. And the difference of a worldly perspective of joy or happiness and the perspective of biblical joy that we only receive from God, that eternal versus the temporary. And as the more and more I studied about peace that comes from God, the more and more unprepared I felt about this morning. The more and more unprepared I felt to speak on a word that I thought I knew what it meant. Peace. You see, peace is not the absence of trials. Peace is not the absence of turmoil. I think about in Matthew chapter 8. Remember the story about Christ being on the boat and the, the boat is being overcome by the waves starting in basically 34 following? And remember how Christ was in that moment remember them getting upset or wondering how in the world could he be asleep in this moment that peace as they go to awake him they said oh you of little faith I think of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 Jed talked about Stephen last week I see a man in the closing remarks of that chapter, a man who had peace. Realizing that he was there to present the gospel of truth, no matter the outcome of what was going to happen for it. As they begin to stone him, I love how the text turns our focus to what he's about to have done to him, to Stephen's remark of looking to heaven. That peace that only God provides. What gives us peace? Everybody strives for peace, Christian or non. And I believe upon my studies of peace over the past week and, and before that, I believe peace may be a great key as a tool for evangelism. Because peace is something everybody wants. You hear people that have never set foot in a church building who've never read the Bible desire peace. You think about people and what they do. They go to vacation to a peaceful beach, to a peaceful mountainside. You've heard the term rest and relaxation. Why? Because they want peace. People desire peace. So they go to the store and they buy a fancy hammock and they hang it under a shaded tree, to find that peace. But you know what all of those things have in common? The hammock underneath the shaded tree, the white sandy beach, or the picturesque mountaintop with a glacier lake full of brown trout. 
All of those things have one thing in common. They come to an end. What happens? As a dad, you're laying in your hammock until your kids start fighting and come running up. Dad, she did this. Well, peace is over. My, my moment of tranquility is over. All good things we've heard must come to an end, except the peace that God provides. That Paul writes about in Philippians chapter 4 that surpasses all understanding in Christ Jesus. You see, that's the key to true peace, is the peace that's only found in Christ Jesus. That no matter what pandemic is sweeping across the nation, that pandemic, guess what church, COVID cannot take away Jesus. Cancer cannot take away Jesus. Therefore, COVID cannot take away peace. Cancer cannot take away peace. The only thing that I can allow to take away peace is my walking away from God. What robs us then of peace? What robbed the church in Philippi of peace? Well, I believe the first couple verses of chapter 4 in Philippians tells us. If you have your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 4. It's a pretty popular, pretty familiar section of Scripture. And because we didn't have a Scripture reading this morning, I just want to start by reading it. So I would encourage you to read along with me, starting in verse 2. It says, I entreat Iodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in your hearts. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have heard and learned and received in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. In these short verses, these eight verses that we just read, I believe Paul tells us what takes our peace away, and Paul tells us what gives us peace. So in these verses, what does Paul tell us that robs us of our peace or that takes away our peace? First of all, he says the absence of harmony in the church takes away our peace. You see, there was some feud going on in the church in Philippi. And these two sisters who were predominant in the church somehow had some kind of, uh, of ability or whatever they were doing there in the church. Everybody knew them and, and everybody loved them and, and they were feuding about something. We can speculate what they were feuding about. The fact is it doesn't really matter what they were feuding about. The fact is they were feuding and it was causing this strife, this tension, if you will, in the church. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all walked into a Sunday morning service and there's a tension. We've all been there. And you can imagine walking into a Sunday morning service in Philippi or walking into somebody's house on a Monday night for dinner and there's a tension because these two sisters are feuding. If there is not harmony in the church, that will rob us of our peace. 
It'll rob us from being who we need to be when we're together, when we're fellowshipping, when we're told to encourage one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. When we're told to be together and encourage each other about the end is coming and Christ is going to come and take us home. But when there's a lack of harmony in the church, it will take away our peace. Something else that the text tells us here that's going to take away our peace is not finding joy in God. We talked a couple weeks ago about joy and the, the difference between happiness and joy and, and how joy is eternal and happiness is temporary. And how most people, when they think about striving after joy, they're really only striving after happiness. But he says, rejoice in the Lord always. This is a key theme in the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says. And again, I say rejoice. Why? Because that's your key to peace, church. If we find happiness, that's great. But those things like worldly peace also fade away. That relaxation comes to an end. That feeling that everything's good goes away when you receive that bill that you were une- not expecting in the mail or receive the phone call of a family member that's now sick. What else takes away our peace? What about the absence of giving our anxieties to God? Look at what the text says. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, verse 5. The Lord is at hand, but what? Do not be anxious about anything. Now listen to me. We've read Matthew chapter 6. You've read it. You know that he tells us to not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow have enough worries. We read this idea here about what? Do not be anxious about... It's hard. That's tough. That's a lot easier said than done. A while back... Actually, it was about a year ago this weekend. We'd received some rough news about Amanda's dad and the health of her parents. And I received some other bad news about a loved one that I had lost recently. And then some other bad news. And I remember going to this verse and going, okay, I know it, but now I'm going to memorize it. Because that way I can recite it to myself every time something comes up. Do not be anxious about anything. Why? Because I need to give that anxiety to God. And if I cannot give those anxieties to God, that will rob me of my peace. That will take away my peace. You ever have those nights where you just can't fall asleep? You just toss and turn and you lie awake and and you're stressing about everything. If you're like me, when I lay down, my brain comes alive. It's like an explosion in my brain. As soon as those lights go off, I overthink everything. I think about everything twice or three times, things I cannot even solve at the moment. I doubt the things I didn't do or did do of that day. But if I'm allowed and if I can train myself to give my anxieties to God, what else takes away our peace? Well, pessimism takes away my peace. Let me ask you a question. Are you a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of person? Do you look at everything with a negative viewpoint do you see the bad in everyone Uh, Billy Currington sings a song most people are good and I do believe that I think we're shown the only bad side of people but do we lack in our positive thinking do we look back at specifically the thing that's on everybody's mind all the time now Do we look back over this last year and think about the bad, or do we look back over this last year and focus on the good? What takes away our peace? Lack of harmony. Not finding joy in God. The absence of giving our anxieties to God. 
and being a glass half empty kind of person. But I know we don't want to end there. You say, Dustin, then what gives us peace? What allows us to have the peace that surpasses all understanding in this world? Peace like a river that flows no matter what, no matter through the torrential rain or the snow melt or the droughts, that river flows over those rocks, completely overcoming everything, continuous flow. What gives us that peace? Well, first of all, striving for harmony in the church gives us peace. You know, he doesn't just say, hey, you guys agree with one another. That's not what Paul says. Because guess what? We're all different and we all can't agree with one another. That's okay. But what does he tell us to agree in? He tells them to agree in the thing we all can agree in, and that's who? Christ. You see, I don't have to have the same hairstyle, dress the same way, drive the same vehicle, have the same hobbies. We don't have to be that way. In fact, because we're different, that's what makes us valuable to the world. But one thing I need to agree on is this. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let's agree on it. Why? Not because I say it, but because the Bible says it. Number two, Jesus Christ is my King. Not because I say it, but because the Bible says it. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I am his soldier. Let's agree on it. I don't care what you drive. I don't care what you wear. I don't care what your hobbies are. Let's agree in Christ. That's what gives us peace. What else gives me peace? If I can learn, and I am speaking to myself first and foremost this morning, if I can learn to cast my anxieties on God. You know, I told you I memorized that scripture. I don't have it memorized anymore because I failed at it. Because the very next time I was presented with something that would give me anxiety, I failed. I'm human. I hate having anxiety. It disrupts my peace. I have to learn how can I cast my burden, cast my cares on him. And I'm going to tell you one thing. Being with you is probably the biggest thing that helps me do that. Being together. Now, that doesn't mean on Sunday morning. It, it includes it. But that means being at lunch with somebody. That means going and playing pig. Or sitting and talking in Jed's office about figuring out the world's problems. That means having dinner at people's houses that we love. That's what helps me take away my anxiety. That's what gives me peace. That's something that God has provided for us in his church. He doesn't stop there, though. We also need to know, not only to give our anxieties to God, but we need to, go, we need to know that when we do give our anxieties to God, that he's going to give us that peace. That's that faith. That's that knowing that, okay, God, I'm going to pray about this anxiety, and when I am done praying, immediately, as soon as I say it, you're going to take that away from me. And that's going to be burden that's lifted off of my chest. I need to know that. That means that I have to let go of it. Now, I'm a fixer. And when I have a problem, guess what I want to do? Fix it. Whether it's my problem to fix or not. Therefore, it's very difficult for me to give something to God and me still not to try to handle it. But I see in this verse when he says, let your request be made known to God. Notice that word and. And is a very important word. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. What? Will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Dustin, do you know who Christ Jesus is? Do you know what he's done for you? 
Do you know how awesome God is and what he can do for you if you give this to him? I need to know that. That will give me peace. I need to not be a pessimist. I need to think on whatever is true. I need to think on the things that are honorable, the things that are right or just. I need to think about those things that are pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. I need to think on the excellent things and the things that are praiseworthy. You see, if I consume my thoughts that way, that will change my demeanor. Hey, I know this past year's been crazy, but look at what's come of it. Look at the closeness of brothers and sisters. I know we have to be six feet apart, but I feel that there's been a closeness spiritually that has come together within this congregation. I feel that there's been a reliance that people have had or maybe not had before that are realizing I have to lean on my brothers and sisters. There's been a charge in, a, in a, uh, this ever-growing determination, I think, of the church to stand together. I think about my life, personally. The extra time I've got to spend with my kids. I've been forced to sit down and do homework with them. Now, I can only do it with the younger two because... The older one's out of my pay rate. I don't know what she's doing and how she's doing it. I can pick up my phone and, and find out the answer via calculator, but that doesn't work. But look at that time I've got to spend with them. Broadway is really focused on our external resourcing of the internet and all the extra people we've reached because we've been almost forced to. Those things are awesome. I need to think on those things that are right and that are true. And no matter what happens, I need to keep Jesus in the forefront of my brain. I need to think about God when the world wants to worship Satan. And no matter who's president, you've heard it before, Jesus is king. I'm going to think about those things. And I'm going to think about what is God preparing me for. What is God preparing the church for? I'm going to focus on the positive. I want to be a glass half full type of person. And then finally, something else that helps us to have this peace is to imitate Christ. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Now I said, and I made my point, of what gives us peace is imitating Christ. Because Paul is writing this. And Paul says in other verses, like 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, he says, therefore, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Are we imitating Christ in our lives? Well, how do we do that? Well, we could look at men like Paul. See, how did he do it? We can read through the Gospels and say, how did Christ do it? There are men and women in this congregation that I can look to and say, that's how I imitate Christ. Look how they handled that in that situation. Look at the patience they had. Look at the generosity of their hearts. Look at the kindness they shared. Look at the way they raised their children. And the God of peace will be with you. We have so many things, church, to be thankful for. And one of those things to be thankful for is that no matter what happens in this world, God has given us the ability to have peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. In the French War, there was a train carrying a load of dispatches from one station to another. 
they had him get him there quickly, so they had to take this specific section of track that really went about 60 miles on a rough section of track that shouldn't have been traveled. Amongst the dispatches was the conductor, the engineer, and the engineer's family, his wife and his two little girls. As they set out as fast as they could go, Across this 60-mile stretch of rail, the train wanted to tip to one side and tip to another over various sections of trail. That one section, they went over a bridge, and you can hear the boards beneath the trail breaking as they were going over this wooden bridge. At one point, they had to make a hard, a sweeping left turn, and it was over a cliff, and they could almost feel the train leaning towards the cliff side. It's said that many people oftentimes held their breath during sections of this rail as it felt as often it would sometimes leave the track. People were crying and tears were shed and and people were holding each other, hoping they were going to make it. And there was one passenger that didn't share the same sentiment as the little girl frolicked in the aisle of the train laughing and smiling as everybody feared for their lives, one older gentleman stopped, him at, stopped her at one point and said, little girl, don't you understand? We may not make it. And she just smiled. She says, do you know who my daddy is? The old man says, no. I don't care who your daddy is. She said, I know who my daddy is. My daddy is the one driving this train. And went on her way smiling, laughing, and frolicking down the aisles. Guess what? We have a father up above that's driving this train. And he provides us with peace more than I can provide it for myself. That peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that only he can provide through his son. The blood that was shed on that cross for my sins that no matter what turmoil I encounter in this world, I can go to bed every night with a peace in my heart because my sins have been forgiven, and so have yours. Or have they? You may be sitting here this morning not understanding peace. You may not quite understand what peace is because you have not met Jesus. You may not understand what peace is because your sins have not been forgiven. You have not given your life over to Christ the King. You have not repented of your sins. You have not been buried in the waters of baptism. You have not been washed clean, so you don't know what peace is. This morning, let me show you peace through the blood of Christ. If there's anybody here who needs to respond to the message this morning, now is the time. Why together we stand and why we sing.